right, ladies and gentlemen, we have some gas for you today. I'm going to be reacting to Dave Ramsey. I, unlike Dave Ramsey, actually am a licensed financial advisor. Uh, he claims to be in this video, which I think is interesting because as a public figure, we can all look into his background and see that it is not the case. But nonetheless, we're going to let him talk. He has a huge platform. A lot of people love him. He actually has a a program by which people like me, uh, financial advisors, financial planners, pay his organization to send people that are interested in investing to us. Um, anyway, we're going to let him uh, talk and I'm not going to go on too many tangents. You guys know by now that I'm a firm believer that the borrower is slave to the lender because your most powerful wealth building tool. This is hugely ironic. Um, just, he, this is kind of a do what I say, not what I do um, type of thing. He, he very well may now uh, be <laughs> suggesting that you not incur any debt, even if it's a mortgage. Um, not gonna straw man him, but both of his parents are real estate developers. He himself went to school for finance and real estate, I believe, at the University of Tennessee, Nashville, and he's never once been licensed as a financial advisor. Maybe he was a real estate broker, which are not the same thing in any way, shape, or form. Anyway, so he, 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 him talking about how debt is not useful is hogwash. Um, both of his parents, I'm sure, can attest to that. Uh, my dad is a property developer, and I can assure you that they do not pay in cash in full if they can get a line of credit that's lesser than the rate of return that they inspect that they expect on the investment then it might make sense you can refer to my last video on this at this particular point here all right we'll let him, we'll let him go. google is your income and when you haven't committed your income in the form of payments to everybody else, you can invest it and become wealthy. Really, the average car payment in America today is $503. That's just cray-cray. That's not... I don't... That's very strange that he's using the word cray-cray. I've only ever heard that in, like, you know, inner, inner, inner Boston. Um, anyway... The other thing, $505 uh, a month for a car payment, it is nutty. If you can at all afford to use alternative transportation, cars are expensive. But if you live in the middle of nowhere and you need a car, you don't really have that option of just not having a car. If you have public transit that costs a couple dollars or a couple cents to use, then why not use that? Or if you have electric motorcycle or an electric car to use those things costs next to nothing compared with gasoline and maintenance and all these other things that you have to deal with with cars but that's a good point i don't have uh, a car payment for this reason and it does free up additional capital to invest nutty if you invest 500 dollars in a decent growth stock i'm going to talk about this all day long so i'm just going to let him go Decent growth stock mutual fund. I'm not so sure he knows what most of those words mean. I think he knows what a mutual fund is, but we'll see. Mutual fund from age 30 to age 70, you'll have over $5 million. That one thing will make you worth $5 million. Isn't that amazing? I'm not sure why he would tell anyone to pick a growth stock mutual fund when mutual funds are inefficient relative to ETFs, so he could just pick the modern day equivalent of the mutual fund, which I think is his boomer way of saying ETF. But for us that know better, it's much better to do an ETF than a mutual fund if two equals exist of the um, of the essentially the same thing. The other thing, growth stock. Why, why, why would you, why would you give blanket financial advice telling people to invest in growth stock? mutual funds that as I said before that's an actively managed portfolio you're gonna rack up fees trading fees in such a portfolio you aren't but they are and they're gonna pass that down to you in the form of management fees how confident are, are you that their active management of their portfolio that you bought into is gonna outperform the market 
because 100 years of history tells me that the market is gonna outperform any money manager. I don't care how professional they are. I don't care what track record they have. I don't care what the pr prospectus says. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go off on a huge tangent on this, but we'll we'll, we'll let him get. And so I've become known for getting people out of debt. Yes, it you changes have. your life. It changes your family tree. It yes, changes it your retirement. You retire with dignity. You don't have to buy that cookbook, 72 Ways to Prepare Alpo and Love It. But you have to do it on purpose. And getting out of debt in order to invest is the shortest way. And what is amazing to me is that almost the entire financial industry focuses on one part of the equation, and that's the investing part of the equation. He's totally right. If you go to someone like me, a financial advisor, they're more than likely, if they're a broker, not going to get into the nitty gritty of your debt. They don't really care how much debt you have, where it is, what the interest rate is, your plan for repayment. However, if you instead seek out the services of an investment advisor, a fiduciary, someone acting on your behalf in your best interest, like a financial planner, like me, it is one of the first things that's brought up in the conversation. I don't want to do something that materially harms you in any way, shape, or form. So if you have interests or debt that you're paying interest on, it doesn't need to be very much of an interest rate for us to say it makes more sense to pay that debt down than it does to invest in the market. Ramsey will talk about how you can earn 12% and I will never tell you that you can earn 12% if we look at, as I said, the market precedent for the 100 years of history that we have, it's closer to like 10 pre-tax and like after tax it's it's lower, it's like 7, 8. Um, that's besides the point. What he's saying about this is true. Most people, what he's gonna say it after this is when you go to an advisor, they don't even wanna talk to you if you don't have any money. If you don't have any money and you have a negative net worth, you need to get a clue as to what you're doing. And if you get it through Dave Ramsey, that's perfectly fine. If you hire a financial planner and they charge you for the advice and tell you that you're not in a position to invest right now and you need to do X, Y, Z, you need to pay this student loan in full, you need to take out a mortgage, you know, it's assuming that's what you want to do, buy a property to, you know, be a landlord and, you know, earn some income that way or so forth. Different, whatever your goal is, we'll, 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 it, he's totally right. They, they, we, we, we collectively, financial professionals focus way too much on investing and that you can really blow a financial plan completely out of water um, by, you know, getting the investments wrong, but you can also do it by overspending and by taking out debt that is in excess of the returns that you're expecting on your investments. So we'll continue. And they all have a bunch of theories. If you don't have $5,000 in your account, then you can skip this ad. I'm serious. If you don't have $5,000 in your account, then these strategies won't work for you. I'm up about 116,000. It's given me the- I was gonna freedom, skip this, but let's watch this. Flexibility to work from home. Each Sunday, I send out my watch list of the three best option plays that I'm looking at for the week for free. Pretty wild, right? My name is Scott Bauer, and I've been trading options professionally for almost 30 years, both as a floor trader in Chicago and hmm. as a vice president for Goldman Sachs. I've even had days where I've made over $900,000 and months where I made over $2.1 million trading. I'm featured daily on news networks. All right, that's CNBC, enough. That's Fox enough. Business, that's TV enough. Now I've had all the letters. Those uh, networks that he just showed, um, my firms also have people on those networks and I can tell you just very candidly, those are paid placements. So if you see someone like in Forbes or on CNBC as a contributor or whatever, it more than likely is paid for. So it's just really slick advertising. Um, we'll... So, so the options guy, the, the Goldman Sachs VP, um, if 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 he were as profitable as he is saying he is, why wouldn't he, if he has a professional background as he's saying he does, why wouldn't he use those connections that he has on Wall Street? Why would he not open a fund, a hedge fund? Why not why not it why not play options in a, in, a, in a hedge fund? Why not take on Hundreds of millions, tens of millions, 
and charge two and twenty and make a whole 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 lot more than with his little newsletter. I bet you he doesn't want to put in the time to be a full time trader anymore, and he would rather uh, you know tell people what he knows, charge for it, and um, you know. If you can't keep up with things, that's not his fault. He's, he's no longer a uh, part of the game. It's just a newsletter. It's just education, man. You know, anyway, I, I doubt he's registered anymore. He probably wouldn't be doing that if he were. And they all have a bunch of theories. Now, I've had all the letters and licenses after my... I talked about this earlier. No, he hasn't. Uh, if you... I encourage you to fact check me. Go check. Go check all the letters and licenses he's had. Uh... I encourage you. Same. I have a degree in finance. I've had all the licenses in the business. It mm. is amazing the number of people in the financial world, whether they're financial advisors, writers, bloggers, whatever they do, that have opinions about money that don't have any money, and whose track record on teaching people to invest and getting them to invest sucks. Three percent of the public is where all of those people make their money off wealthy people. They make all their money off wealthy. That's a fair critique. There are very, very, very few firms um, that <laughs> target, you know, middle, middle, lower income people. Um, it's not as profitable. If I'm going to develop a relationship with someone, and they have a given number of assets, it is well worth my time to spend, you know, X amount of hours with them. But if someone comes along and they have ten times that amount of money, hundred times that amount of money, a thousand times that amount of money. My fee goes down the more money, you know, someone has with me. But when we're talking tens of millions of dollars, that's a whole career on a on a, on, a, on a single client. Um, it's it's a, it's a fair criticism. It it it, it really is. There's a huge uh, there's a gap in in the need that's um, not being met. As, as I said, with lower income people, because it's not, there's, there's people make the cost benefit analysis and they go, ah, it makes more sense to focus on wealthier people. And the same thing goes in insurance. It's, it seems to be across financial services, unfortunately. Wealthy people. And most of the advisors out there won't fool with you if you don't have some money. True. They don't want to sit down and talk to you. True. And so we started teaching people, of course, all these years ago, how we invest. And then as we've met with many, many, many thousands of millionaires over the years, how did they invest? What are they doing? Well, we suggest, and I personally invest in good growth stock mutual funds. Hogwash. We'll let them continue. I spread it across four types. Growth and income, growth, aggressive growth, and international. And this, that little, that little pie right here, this little... I spread little, it across four types, growth and in... This thing, he's going to, he's going to tell you some things and I'm going to interject, but I just want you to pay attention to this. This is a mutual fund portfolio with four different, presumably, mutual funds. I have no idea if they're from the same issuer or not, but he is mistaking the objectives of these funds for what they hold. And then he's gonna go on to say, well, I don't invest in anything that I don't understand and you shouldn't either. And then he'll go on to say, 80% of my decision is based on the historical performance. So I guarantee you when he goes and looks at the prospectus, he's not looking for what exactly the fund is composed of. Maybe it's full of 80% equities. How, how would he know? He didn't check. Uh, the other thing with this is, these are, as I said, objectives. So having an allocation that spills into several of these gives me a, the inkling that you are confused as to what these are for. So if I determine, or sorry, if anyone determines the risk tolerance to be, you know, I'll give it a number, one to a hundred. Say they're extremely aggressive. They're very early on in their life. You know, they, they want to shoot for the moon and, you know, balls to the wall, aggressive. So maybe they're thinking growth, probably aggressive growth. To split it between growth and growth in income makes no sense at all. If, if I need income, 
from my portfolio, I'm very likely retired. If, if, if I need growth only, not aggressive growth, I'm likely a bit older. Maybe I'm in my mid thirties. Maybe I need to let off of the gas a, a weedsy bit. Maybe I don't need to be extremely aggressive anymore. And then international, I'm confused. It, 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 international what? An international equity fund? An international bond fund? It, 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 he doesn't, I know he's trying to keep it simple, but I feel like he's oversimplified it to the detriment of people because these have conflicting objectives. So how do you know that growth and income isn't selling Johnson & Johnson when aggressive growth is buying Johnson & Johnson? How do you know? Are you running Morningstar analysis on these portfolios over time to make sure that the, the managers, which aren't communicating with one another and aren't checking their trades off of one another, are you making sure that their trades aren't impacting you negatively? No, you are not. Do not do this. Do not get actively managed portfolios in such a precise quantity because some guy on the radio told you to do so. If that is the difference between you investing and not investing, maybe it's a good idea. I would argue there are much better ideas uh, than to follow this blanket financial advice. Income growth, aggressive growth, and international, and I buy mutual funds that have at least a 10-year track record. Well, Dave, shouldn't you just buy index funds? Well, you can if you want. Index funds, basically an S&P 500 fund, mirrors the market. That basically is the stock market. And so you're going to do exactly what the stock market does, good or bad. The mutual funds that I buy outperform the S&P 500, and they're really not that hard to find. This drives me up the wall. So in investing, there is something called the market efficiency hypothesis, which basically goes that what he's describing to you is not possible to do consistently over a long period of time. So he says 10 years, maybe it can happen over 10 years, over 15, over 20, over 30. I am, I'm willing to bet my entire net worth. I'm willing to bet the net worth of my children that the market will outperform the most expensive money manager Buffett in, I think it was 08, might've been 09, um, took out a bet against some hedge fund guys and they basically could pick whichever funds they wanted and they charted, you know, the start point for each compared with, you know, just a market index and Buffett won the bet. Buffett won $1 million over 10 million or over 10 years. These professional money managers collectively couldn't select funds in the way that he, Dave Ramsey is saying is so extremely easy that any lay person can do it. Just look at their perspective. And if line is above S and P line, well, there you go. So we're going to let him continue, but this is the most, this has got to be one of the most ridiculous things that I've ever heard. A lot of mutual funds don't outperform the S&P 500. So if you're going to buy that, well, that'd be dumb. Just buy an S&P 500. But I buy mutual funds that outperform the S&P 500. And my portfolio mix that I just outlined is pretty much always beats the market. Pretty much because I buy always funds that outperform beats the market because I buy funds that outperform the market. If it were that easy, if it were that easy, if it were just as simple as looking at historical return for a given fund and maybe it's the best performing fund a given year. He's saying that it's, you have a great deal of certainty if you have a 10 year track record of them doing that. What I'm telling you is the evidence says precisely the opposite. So I would guarantee you that if he were willing to show us his portfolio, his stock portfolio, and I were to compare it to a relevant index based on you know what exactly he has in it so if it's full of REITs I'm not gonna or real estate investment trusts I'm not gonna compare it to the S&P 500 you know if it's all full of blue chips uh, blue chips I'm not gonna compare it um, to the NASDAQ 100 um, it, it, it however I would be fair and compare it with whatever 
index most closely aligned with what his portfolio was made out of. And what comparing it to the index would show me is would he have done better just buying the index? He's telling you, you can buy the index if you want to phone it in and you don't you don't really know what you're doing. Like, meh, I'm sure you could buy, you just buy an index fund, but it's more fun to look into the prospectus and see which line is higher and then make 80% of your investment decision on that. That makes a lot more sense, according to Dave Ramsey, which I, again, think is like painful. It's like painfully ridiculous. The market, it's not that hard to do. You open up the prospectus and there's two little hey, lines on the- That's what I was talking about. So here's a prospectus. So if you haven't seen a prospectus, um, you will see on a prospectus, relevant information about the security of the fund that you're looking at. It's gonna tell you who the managers are. It's gonna tell you what the fees are. It's gonna tell you everything that you need to know generally about investing in that fund, short of what it's actually invested in. Usually that's something else. It'll tell you an outline of what it's allowed to invest in, but it generally isn't kept up to date with the portfolio turnover. So it's not gonna tell you exactly what's in it. But you'll see in a prospectus, uh, a graph such as this comparing the fund's performance to its relevant benchmark a relevant index like the s p 500 and he's telling you that if you can get a 10-year history as you have here from 06 to 2016 and it's higher than the s p 500 well then duh of course you have a winner that right there is a golden goose and if you bag it you know you'll do better than people who just buy the market ridiculous the graph one of them is the s&p 500 if the mutual fund you're looking at if that line is below that s&p 500 line don't buy that fund Duh. i'm willing to bet the derision that he shows towards people that buy funds that underperform the mutual fund uh, the 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 index is is criticism that he should reserve for himself i bet you I bet you he doesn't have an advisor that is comparing, or himself even, that's comparing his returns to relevant index. I just did that on my last video. I can link that here. Um, it's it's really aggravating uh, as a, an investment professional to have people so so confidently wrong. This is hard. Really not that much to this. But Dave, you just tell people buy those loaded funds. Yeah, they'll pay a commission, that's fine. Have somebody in your life helping you. That makes no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. If I'm paying a commission, I do not have someone advising me. I have a salesperson. If someone is making a commission, I have a salesperson. Their interests are not aligned with mine. Their best interest is what's paying the highest commission. They are, they are under no obligation to do what is in my best interest, which is what pays, what's, what has the highest uh, rate of return, what has the lowest fees, what has the most appropriate level of risk. Um, he's saying that yeah, if you hire a broker and you buy a mutual fund and you pay a commission, now you have someone in your corner. Now you have someone to advise you. That is going to get you screwed, my friends. That will not end well for you. Um, as I just said, someone making a commission from a mutual fund sale, it's what's called a broker, according to FINRA, they receive commissions, their standards, their professional standards are not the same as mine are. I have to act in your best interest. They have to act in a suitable interest, which basically means, do you have money? Can you afford it? If you can afford it, it's suitable. I say it's suitable. If, 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 the, if the security issuer is going to take your money, sure, it's suitable. There's really no, as I was saying earlier, they're not going to dig into your debt, where it is, how much it is, the interest rate, your plan for repayment. It's not really important. They're, they don't make a commission if they tell you to take, take your money and pay your debt down. They don't make a commission. You have to buy something or they don't make a commission. So if you want someone to act to act in your best interest, to be in your corner, to help you, do not buy a mutual fund from a broker and expect advice. Do not do it. Do the investing. All the data says that you'll continue to invest doing that, but when you're out there by yourself with all your theories, 
and some idiot newscaster comes on the evening news predicting the end of the world, what do you do? You cash out all your mutual funds at exactly the wrong time. There is something to be said with that. Making decisions, it, inv investing money decisions in general on emotion is generally a catastrophic idea. And um, what he's describing here is something to be avoided. You definitely do not want to sell uh, at exactly the wrong time. And one of the things that I as an advisor do is um, reassure people that the course that we're plotting along will reach us to our destination. So it may be bumpy, the waves may be really big, it may be really uncomfortable, but the ship is sound, the track is sound, and I'm confident that we're going to get here in X amount of time. I'm actually, I can tell you the degree of certainty that I have that we're going to get there in X amount of time. So this kudos to him here on this. Because you don't have anybody in your corner saying, don't jump, don't jump. Stead, you're just out. Do not, do not, do not, do not. A broker is not someone in your corner. A mutual fund salesman is not someone who is in your corner. They may have a heart of gold. They may be a great person. Their financial interests are not aligned with yours. And they will never be so long as they are commission-based salespeople. Who pays that commission? You, you pay that commission. Out there with your own emotions and the newscaster, and that's how you pick out when you jump in or out of the market, and that's just dumb. So all the data says a decent portfolio of good performing mutual funds wins. All the data says index forms, index funds outperform active mutual funds over any long period of time. Maybe you can cherry pick a great performing fund, maybe the Renaissance Capital ETF that tracked IPOs, and maybe it was when IPOs were super hot in like 2020 and 2021, and maybe it did super well. And it's now like one of the lost leaders in terms of its year-to-date performance, as is Kathy Wood's ARP funds. They're bleeding badly. Um, so very, very generally, the, the, the more quickly something goes up, the more quickly something comes down. And the big thing is actually putting money into the mutual funds, actually investing. One piece of research shows that 74% of the reason of retirement success is doing it. It's called savings rate. The number of you that put money in versus talk about it and continually put money in. It's funny that they showed that. I'm not going to comment on that. But what is interesting about not specifically that, but something related is what has a much greater degree of effect on your returns, your portfolio's returns, aren't the individual securities that you select. It's your asset allocation, like your class classes of asset allocation. So I might have picked the best corporate bonds in the world and might almost certainly uh, gotten blown out of the water by you know some random selection of equities that maybe not even, maybe wasn't even screened um, just because the nature of the two investments aren't at all alike. So this, um, oopsie. This, uh, the savings rate that he's talking about is, is interesting. Rate. The number of you that put money in versus talk about it and continually put money in. Year after year, year after year, year after year, month after month, week after week, out of your check, into your 401k. So yeah, no, this, this is, this is, what he's saying is extremely important. So if you can automate it, that is um, a huge thing in, in your favor and, and the greatest, what, what, what he's saying about the study is true. So the more consistently I save over the over a longer period of time, the greater the likelihood that my retirement is going to be at that level that I want it to be. So if we wait until we're 40, it's not it's not so likely anymore. You know, um, is it possible? It's totally possible. But is it way easier if I start as soon as I start earning income? Yeah, it is. It's way easier.
Okay, over and over and over and over and over again. This is how you get wealthy. It's ludicrous. I know a lot about mutual funds. Dude, no you don't. And let me tell you how I pick mutual funds. About 80% of the choice on my mutual fund, 85%. Oh, I was going to jump in. I was going to jump in. Let me jump Imagine in. Imagine if you had a stock. Nope. Is based on its rate gotta, of return. We got to redo that. And let me tell you how I pick mutual funds. About 80% of the choice on my mutual fund, 85%, is based on its rate of return. No one, no one, no professional investor on planet Earth is going to tell you that the way that they select investments is by picking the one that has performed the best the most recently. That is not how investment decisions are made. For him to tell everyone listening to him that this is worthwhile advice that is replicatable and of benefit to you to follow is mind-blowing to me it's track record if the track record's tied and i'm trying to look i look for the longest track record who's been doing it a long time i like neighborhoods with big oak trees when i'm buying real estate you see what i'm saying i like a long track record something stable i don't like risk i like to make money risk equals not making money for me big risk anyway we should spread it across four types growth and income growth aggressive growth that doesn't make sense at all that makes no sense that makes no sense. Risk is your appetite um, for something fluctuating in value. So if I can't stand my assets fluctuating in value, maybe I have cash. Maybe I have treasury bills. Maybe I have treasury bonds. Maybe I have corporate bonds. Maybe I have commercial paper. If I am not, if I'm totally fine with it fluctuating wildly, maybe I have cryptocurrency. Maybe I have everything in cryptocurrency. Maybe I'm totally unfazed if my net worth fluctuates 50% in a day. That, as far as I know, is what risk means. So risk equals not making money for, oh, he's saying for me. So he's, he's, I mean, his, his whole show is about talking about his personal experience and saying that that must be applicable to your life. Um, risk equals not making money is also ludicrous and makes no sense on its face. And if we dig into his background, I think that it just will show that he has a uh, misunderstanding of what risk means in a financial context. Big risk anyway. We should spread it across four types, growth and income, growth, aggressive growth, and international. Ridiculous for the, the reasons I stated earlier. How, how are you gonna know that your fund picks are going to outperform over the next 10 years? You can't. And in fact, I'm willing to bet good money that your picks will not outperform. If professional money managers couldn't pick the funds that would outperform the market, why can you? Why are you better than people who have been doing this for decades? People that have education in finance, education, masters, MBAs, why, 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 would, why would you, a novice presumably, or maybe an intermediate, maybe, a, maybe an amateur, maybe you are a professional. And if you are a professional, I bet you know better. I bet your money's in index funds like mine is. So we'll just, we'll let him continue. This is ridiculous. Let's talk about those for a second because there's all kinds of names for mutual funds and the name of the mutual fund tells you what is in the fund. Nope, it does not. So, no, it doesn't. The prospectus will tell you what the fund is composed of generally. The name will tell you the objective of the fund. So if it says Vanguard, large cap, equity, growth fund, it's issued by Vanguard. It's large cap, so that's 50 billion or 100 billion a value, I think it's 50, um, above that. So it would be only stocks of that value or greater, and it would be only stocks because it said equity. So it's only stock, and then it's only growth. So it's not value, meaning if we were to go into the financials of the company and give it metrics, ratios, based on the price relative to its financials, we would see growth stocks relative to value stocks, growth have higher price to earnings ratios. So people are more 
bullish, if you say, on you know the price action of the growth stocks. They're more volatile than value stocks. Value stocks, on the other hand, are he he actually speaks about them, but I don't think he calls you calls them value stocks. I'll I'll point it out when he does so. Fund, okay. A growth and income fund is also called a large cap fund, sometimes also called a blue chip fund. Now, the blue chip is the most expensive chip on the poker table, so that means these are... I think he's just throwing names all over the place. I, I, those are not... One of those could be the other, um, but those are not all synonymous with one another. Um, and to come, to come out of this thinking that is, is, a, is a mistake. They're big companies in this. Large cap is short for large capitalization. Large capitalization means these are large companies. And so your growth and income funds are large companies. Boring. Of the four types of mutual funds that I put money into and I recommend. Got it. That's what he's talking about. So he's calling the growth and income, uh, or I'm calling I don't want to. I don't want to speak on his level. He's got me confused. His 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 little his little explanations of what exactly these are are not correct. Um, please do not <laughs> listen to what he is saying. I mean, feel free to listen to what he's saying, but double check it. Check it. Check it for yourself. Look on um, Investopedia. It's like Wikipedia, but for all the esoteric financial terms like growth, equity, mutual fund. Um, and it'll explain to you in plain English so that you can understand it. That is where I have, frankly, learned most everything uh, is Investopedia. So shout out Investopedia. This is the calmest. If you were to chart this volatility on this fund versus the stock market, you would see it's a lot calmer. So this is what he's saying. So, 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 so the growth and in income stocks he's saying are large cap stocks and they're paying income so they're paying dividends so they're likely more developed more well-established companies in more mature industries with less opportunity for future growth and therefore the markets are less enthused either way or less less enthused and less disappointed either way with 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 value stocks and with growth it's kind of the opposite so like good news really bumps it up and bad news really hits it down and then on the flip side on the value it's not as big of an impact so maybe some terrible news comes out with some mega cap or some large cap that pays a dividend maybe it'll drop 10 percent in a day and that's like a floor shaking move but some smaller stock routinely drop 25 percent a day even more some have dropped well above that um like i think goldman when it was failing dropped something crazy like that in a day or not goldman sorry uh lehman 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 when it was failing dropped something crazy like that in a day. but we'll let we'll let it than the market and so it's your friend when things are going down in other words it's your stable it's the big old dinosaur companies they're boring when things are going up by the way it's also boring it's not exciting when things are going up. It's a downer. You look at that thing going, why is it not doing well when the rest of the market's going up? Because it goes... That's pretty much what I just said. ...slower than the market up and slower than the market down because it's a stable land. A growth fund is right in the middle. The S&P 500 index fund would be considered a growth... No, it would not. It is absolutely not considered a growth fund. I am not sure who his financial advisor is. I would argue he either doesn't have one. If he does, he doesn't speak to them. If he does speak to them, they don't speak about anything important. Um, that is not at all what uh, a growth fund is. Growth fund. A growth fund is companies that are growing. They're kind of medium-sized companies, so you might hear it called mid-cap fund. These are just... What? What? He's, so he's calling the S&P 500 a mid-cap growth stock fund? It just gets more ridiculous. That is not what it is. This is not what it means. Mid-cap is one notch lower than large cap. So assuming I'm right, assuming 50 billion is large cap, I believe mid-cap is 20 billion capital or capitalization. Um, so he's he's losing the plot. 
I feel like we started and lost the plot immediately, and I feel like he's just being consistent throughout, and we still have not found it. Standard growth stock mutual funds. There's a whole lot of these out there. Ton of funds that fall in this area. The idea is pretty simple. The growth fund, that's kind of right there in the middle. You want something in the middle. It's pretty much going to do about what the market does in terms of volatility, but you can get mutual funds that are growth stock mutual funds that outperform the S&P 500. You can even get growth and income funds, even though they're not as volatile, that outperform the S&P 500. Then there's the aggressive growth fund. This is the one. You can absolutely buy a fund that outperforms the S&P 500. Can you do so over a period of time greater than 10 years? I, as I said earlier, am willing to bet my entire net worth and that of my children that you can. not And the data would back me up. And I would encourage you to look into that data. Buffett made a public bet for a million dollars, knowing I'm sure that he wasn't gonna lose. So I'm in an es in essence making the same bet um, and I know I'm not gonna lose. Wild brother, okay? It's the crazy one. And so you might guess it's gonna be also called a small cap funds. These are the small companies, the startups, a lot of tech companies that fall into there very crazy all the fun weird stuff is in there and that means some of it fails and goes to zero and so it's a crazier mix it's going to be much more volatile than the stock market is so it's going to go up faster than the market goes up but it's going to go down faster than the market goes down small cap aggressive growth stock mutual funds also known in there as emerging market you would call it that too what? as well what internet no 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 oh he was almost done with a thought that I didn't have a problem with. Small cap, aggressive, growth stock mutual funds. Nothing about that. There's nothing wrong with that. What he said here, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. And then he, he, he screws it all up. Growth stock mutual funds. Also known in... That is not what is known as an emerging market. Oh. There as emerging market, you would call it that too, as well. No, you wouldn't. International funds means that the stock. It's almost as if he his scriptwriter was confused. I know he's not right. Now he's not reading a script. This is all you know from the hip for him. But an emerging market is an international market. We have different types of international markets. We have developed international markets. We also have emerging international. Markets. So to call your small cap growth stock mutual fund an emerging market fund, I think would run afoul of the SEC because that's like blatant misrepresentation. But let's continue. In it are overseas companies. Damn it, Ramsey. Want to become a consistent trader? Then stop making your charts look like this because you don't need to do a bunch of technical they're not american companies it has a kissing cousin called a global fund if you think of a globe what is it it's everything so that would have international and u.s companies in a global fund and it would be a cousin to an international by the way american companies generally outperform other international companies by and large as a group and so your international fund will be your worst performing of the four over the last several decades and a global fund will outperform an international fund because you put some spice in there you put some american companies in there usually and so they're a little bit better but at least you got some stuff overseas you're not a hundred percent betting on the american economy not that i'm anti-american i am not this is not a patriotic thing this is a diversification thing and so, you know, you want to have some BMW and some Mercedes. Be very careful if you think that you're getting international exposure by following his advice and you're not actually looking at um, the details in the prospectus. It'll, it'll generally show you where things are allocated, especially if it's an international or global. And if you look at it, in my experience at least, I've seen it overwhelmingly weighted to the U.S. So maybe... The U.S. is the largest holding, and maybe second is like Japan with like 7%. Um, so with a grain of salt, I would approach um, uh, global global funds because I, I, I find them to be um, overly uh, exposed to the American market. The American market is enormous. We are 
you know, responsible for an enormous amount of um, trading volume, but it is not the whole world. There's a whole world, wide world. We're responsible for like 5% of the world population, something thereabouts. So wide world out there. I agree. Uh, you know, there's some room for international in there. In there. You want to have some LG and some other stuff, even though some... But be careful. So like you, you buy a fund, you might be buying 50% of a fund that, you know, 25% of that fund is Apple. And then maybe 7% of that fund is LG. So for each dollar you put in, 7% is, you know, international, or not international, but to LG specifically. So I just, I would encourage everyone to look into what they own. Uh, Peter Lynch says, know what you own, know why you own it. Uh, maybe I screwed that up, maybe it's backwards, but that's basically what he says. And that's great advice. Some of those things are made stateside. Those are foreign companies. And so you look for companies that are overseas based, could be a French company, could be whatever, that are in an international fund. And then you spread your investing across those four types. Very simple here. The thing is, do it. Too simple. I like that he's like, do it so that you start it and like hopefully keep with it and, and, and receive the perks from doing it. Uh, my issue with his, here's this for fund, it's simple, do it. Uh, there's a lot left to be desired in the realm of accuracy, unfortunately. So I feel like this might be an interesting niche for me to fill. That's the thing. Everybody talks and talks and talks and talks and talks about investing. The problem is nobody does it. People we talk to on the millionaire theme hour that are millionaires, you know how they got to be millionaires? They did it. And they never, when I ask them how they became millionaires, they never say, oh man, I hit the home run. They never say that, because it never happens. Oh, Dave, I hit the home run. I got this mutual fund that went straight up and I made all my money in one good buy. You know, my golfing buddy gave me a stock tip. I don't meet millionaires that did that. I hear stories about it, but a golfing buddy with a stock tip is like a golfing buddy with a fishing story, the one that got away. I mean, it's just everybody's got an opinion and it's all a bunch of crap. And so you just have to really stop and go slow and steady. Actually investing is the way. It's the way. It's the only way to go. So growth and income, growth, aggressive growth, international. Don't slow and steady is the only way to go. Don't chase the returns. Don't chase the returns. Don't chase the returns. Okay, so explain to me, Dave Ramsey, why you just explained your investment strategy and it was literally, for, forgive me, correct me if I'm wrong. What did he say, 80, 85% chasing the returns? Did I get that right? He's telling me don't chase the returns? So do what I say, not what I do? Okay. Do not invest money in things you do not understand interesting that is very interesting coming from him i totally agree with it but i think it is very interesting that his explanations of his own portfolio and why he owns those types of mutual funds doesn't mesh with the reality that i know to be uh as far as what those things are so this perplexes me Stand. People get ripped off when they invest money in things that someone told them is good and they trusted the person. This is literally what's happening right now. This is exactly what's happening. Instead of knowing what the flip they were doing. You know all these athletes you read about? The NFL stars and they lost $10 million or they made $100 million and it's all gone and you know? You know how they lose their money? Because they give it to someone else to handle and they don't even look at it. And then they're shocked to find out that person was a crook. That's how you lose your money. It's your money. Just like it's your kids. Which means you have to make it behave. It's like you have to make your kids behave. You have to do that. If you want good kids, that's how it's going to happen. If you want money, this is how it's going to happen. You have to understand it. Now, you don't have to have a master's degree in finance. This stuff is not rocket science. It is really not that difficult. And you really, really seriously have to do this. He overcomplicated it for no reason. Just, I need to point that out. And you have to understand what the money is going into. Do not... And it's so ironic that he's telling me that I need to understand it when he just, the, so many things about this are so contradictory. I feel like I've taken up way too much of your time. Not put money in. That's why when you're buying insurance, when you're getting a mortgage, doing your investing in mutual funds, that's why when you do all of that, that you 
have to understand what you're doing. And the only way you're going to do that is when you're picking someone to help you in one of those areas. You're doing your estate plan if it's complicated. You're doing your taxes if they're complicated. That kind of thing. You need someone sitting on the other side of the table that is not a salesperson, but they... Why? Why is he saying that when he advised me earlier to specifically seek out the services of a mutual fund salesman? Maybe he's confused. In fact, I know he's confused. You have the heart of a teacher, not the heart of a salesperson. I'm an easy sale once I understand something. But until I understand it, I'm not putting a dime in it. I'm not going forward with this. It's I find that ironic. He doesn't go forward with an investment until he understands it. And yet 80 to 85% of his investing decisions are based on the historical rate of return over the last 10 or more years as laid out in the prospectus. Not the mutual fund managers, not it's just it's really baffling to me and i really wish that he would consult historical data thank you guys for tuning in today hopefully you learned a thing or two uh, if you did please leave a like and i will bring you some more knowledge hopefully uh as soon as possible